Hello and welcome to Cantley Methodist Church YouTube channel. I'm glad that uh, you are able to join with us this morning. And uh, this is the fourth Sunday after Easter. And if you know something about uh, the lectionary, today is uh, what we call the Vocational Sunday. Vocational Sunday is uh, uh, that Sunday when we, the Methodists and other Christians, we think about our calling. What is it that God has called us to? What is our commissioning? What is our purpose as people of God? And uh, the fourth Sunday in Easter also, the Christians have nicknamed it as Sheep Sunday. Sheep Sunday because most of our readings this morning are going to be to revolve around uh, the sheep and the shepherd. Now, first of all, let's listen to a track. And I've uh, carefully chosen this one as uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not uh, want the popular uh, well-known hymn. Now, the people of Cantley Methodist Church, uh, they know something about sheep and shepherds. Why? Because their pastoral leaders are called shepherds. And if, if there must be shepherds, then also there must be sheep. And I think we, the Christians, uh, are the sheep and our uh, pastoral leaders. Uh, our shepherds in that sense of the word. And actually they have done a pretty good job recently. They have called, they have tried to reach each and every one of us uh, at this time when we are locked into our houses. On a, a, a Sunday like this, when we are thinking about the good shepherd, most of the hymns that are, take, uh, are sung are taken uh, from that, those imageries of sheep and shepherd. The one we have just listened to, the lawns is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, the other one, which is quite popular on a day like this, is the lawn, the king of love, my shepherd is. This wonderful king who loves us so much is also our shepherd. The popular readings for a day like this, uh, you know, Psalms 23 is a popular one. Many of us know Psalms 23 by heart. And then there is Ezekiel 34, which again, uh, God complains about the leaders, the shepherds of Israel, because they have not taken care of the sheep. 
what has happened is that the leaders have abandoned the duty of taking care of the sheep and they have taken to eating the sheep. They have taken to abandoning the sheep to wild animals. And those that have broken, have broken limbs, the leaders have not um, bandaged them. So God is really complaining in Ezekiel that uh, four. Now, this morning, our reading is taken from the New Testament, uh, John 10, and I'm reading from verses 7. It's, uh, the heading is Jesus the Good Shepherd. Jesus the Good Shepherd. So Jesus said, to, uh, said again, I'm telling you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All others who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the gate. Those who come in by me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come in order that you might have life, life in its fullness. And then verses 11, uh, Jesus continues to say, I am the good shepherd who is willing to die for the sheep. But the hired man who is not a shepherd and does not care for the sheep, sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. So the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. I want to read verses 27 and 28, which says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, they are and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never die. No one can ever snatch them away from me. Not everyone remembers why Jesus had to give this parable of the sheep and the shepherd in the New Testament in St. John. Jesus has come across a young man who was born blind. And Jesus has mixed his own saliva with the soil and he has wrapped the man on the eyes of the blind young man and he has told him to go to the Sea of Siloam and wash. And for the first time, this young man has come seeing and he is ecstatic, he is excited, he wants everybody to know what has happened. And he is telling everybody uh, the wonderful, wonderful things that Jesus has done. Now, you would have expected everybody to be excited uh, about this good act. Think again. The religious authorities are not amused one little bit. They say, Jesus who? Indeed what? And they summon the parents. And the parents know that the stakes are quite high, so they are a little kingy. They say, well, we, we can affirm two things. One, we can tell you that this is our son. Number two, we can tell you that he was born blind. As to the circumstances of his healing, he is of age. Let him tell you himself. And so the young man is questioned one more time. Who healed you? What happened? How can he heal you on a Sunday? And the young man says, the man called Jesus, uh, rubbed, makes his saliva with the soil and rubbed my eyes and now I can see. When we were in high school, we used to sing uh, a chorus which was uh, saying, Glory to God, he remembered me, and so he set me free. Once I was blind, but now I can see. Glory to God, he remembered me. This young man could have sung the same. Glory to God, 
He remembered me. He set me free. Once I was blind, but now I can see. And so Jesus, when he came across a young man uh, the following day, and uh, he knew that he had been thrown out of the synagogue because they threw him out of the synagogue because of affirming that Jesus had healed him. Even though in pretext they said it's because he had been healed on a Sunday, on a Sabbath. And Jesus in the hearing of these religious leaders, he said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. He is essentially saying, you guys, you are the bad shepherds. In fact, in, in their hearing, he calls them bandits, thieves, and robbers. He says, you are the guys who don't come through the main gate. You come through, uh, you break in into the ship's pen through some other way because your intent is not good. Uh, you want to kill, you want to steal, you want to destroy. These religious leaders were more concerned about the scruples of the law more than a good act. That this young man, for once, he was able to see, but they were more concerned that Jesus unhealed on a Sabbath. And this was not an isolated case. Many, many other times they took offense at Jesus doing a good act. You remember the other man who he healed and he said, take your pallet and go. And the, the guy said, the religious leader said, how can you carry a pallet? How can you carry your bench on a Sunday? Uh, when Jesus again came across a woman that these religious leaders wanted to stone, Jesus started writing on the soil with his finger. And he said, whoever does not have sin, let him cast the first stone. And they started departing one by one because they knew that, you know, even though they wanted to stone the woman, these them, themselves were not faultless. In any case, she couldn't have seen alone where was the man that, uh, you know, was involved in the act with her. But Jesus said, I'm not going to condemn you because nobody else has condemned you. Uh, go and sin no more. Jesus is in the business of restoring us into our status as sons and daughters of God. Uh, you remember when uh, he came across a man called Zacchaeus, the short man, and he went to eat in his home, and uh, these religious leaders again were complaining, and Jesus said, Salvation has come to this home because this man is also a son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So when he talks about him being the good shepherd, he is really contrasting himself with these religious leaders who are hell-bent to find fault with everything that Jesus did. I want to draw you to uh, attention to verses 27 and 28. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. When I used to teach at Urban Theology Unit in Sheffield, uh, one of our colleagues was called Christine, and she had a cat. I think the cat was called Toby, I, if I remember now. And if Christine left Toby in the house, and she came to the office, which was not far away from her house, Toby and devised ways of getting out. And Toby would negotiate all those blocks of buildings, come and and they sit at the door of the office, and when somebody opened the door for anything, 
she will just sneak in and head straight to Christine's office. She knew she knew where Christine was. Uh, there was a close relationship between her and Toby. Just like our dogs also. Uh, if it's not on leash and it hears you are the agent of your car, it will come to meet you on the driveway. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. On a vocational Sunday, uh, like today, we are challenged. We ask, are we, do we listen to the voice of God? Are we those people who listen with a that ear, as it were, the ear of the Spirit? What God is telling you and me? What is God to say to us in this crisis of the coronavirus? Are we can we get a spiritual meaning out of this? In the last few years, uh, two books have become quite uh, popular uh, as Bible study books. And I want to talk about one of them. Uh, the other one, the, the one I will not talk about is called The Holy Habits. But the one I want to talk about uh, today it's called the five practices of fruitful concreations. Five practices of fruitful concreation. It's written by uh, an American Methodist minister, Robert Smash. Now, you might tell me that we can't talk about fruitful congregations when we have a lockdown. I really can. Why can I? Because the Church of God is not the buildings. The Church of Christ is not experiencing a lockdown. We are, uh, you can't, you can't imprison the spirit of God. I'm told, for example, the underground church in China grew very fast in this century. In fact, somebody has said, it was the fastest growing church in this century, even though it experienced all sorts of restrictions from the, from the government. And therefore, the point I'm making is that the church is, 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 uh, is well, uh, is kicking, is alive, and is well. Now, those practices that Robert Snash talks about the things that should characterize us as people of God. The first one is what he calls radical hospitality. Radical hospitality. I can tell you that I've been amazed at uh, uh, the hospitality of God's people at this uh, time of COVID-19. People have gone out of the way uh, to shop for others. People have gone out of the way to get medicine for others. People have gone out of the way uh, to make up that important call, phone call and to pray with and for others. For example, I know in Cantley we have a whole chain of prayer. You know, uh, we are praying and upholding people in prayer uh, and therefore the church the church of Christ is, is alive and well the thing the second thing that Robert Nash talks about is what he calls passionate worship passionate worship that the church of God should be characterized by passionate worship now see this this time of COVID-19 uh, we should not so much throw our hands in the air and say things are bad. This is the time to really get close to God. Uh, somebody has said that we should never waste a crisis. Don't waste a crisis. Capitalize on it, use it, uh, turn it around, make the most out of it, let some good come out of it. Uh, and so 
I would expect that in this time of COVID-19, because we have more time in our hands, we should spend more time in prayer. We should spend more time in worship and praise. Maybe there is that book that we have always wanted to read. This is your time to read. Uh, there is that tape you have always wanted to listen to. This is your time. You cannot complain that you have no time in your hands. The that practice of fruitful creation is what he calls intentional faith development. Intentional faith development. Intentional faith development is really where you go out of your way to develop yourself. Uh, read a good book. Listen to a testimony. Um, you know, some mu music. Write a book if you can. Uh, talking about writing a book, I've had time in my hands to revise my manuscript and it's now published into a book. It's called Time, History and Hope. It is a theological piece uh, about African theology. But also, I'll tell you something else that has come out of this situation for me. There's a book I've always wanted to read, The Confessions by St. Augustine. And uh, I've been able to read it. It's, it's, a, it's a Christian classic. Can I recommend that you look for the confessions, uh, in, you know, order it in one of the bookstores and read it for yourself. It will, it will do you good. Augustine discovered God uh, at the height of the crisis of his life when he had been appointed professor of rhetorics in Milan, Italy. Uh, he, he went to hear Bishop Ambrose, but much more than hearing Ambrose, he had the word of God. Uh, it's a good book to read. And the fourth principle, the fourth practice that Robert Schnarch recommends is what he calls extravagant generosity. Extravagant generosity. You see, we are not only invited to be a hospitable people, we are also uh, called to be a generous people with our time, with our talents, with our skills. For example, uh, people have gone out of the way to donate their time to reach out to others at this time. And there are those others who are very well skilled in IT. Uh, those are the people who have made, uh, you know, a recording like this accessible to us in our own homes. And so we really want to thank God for all the skills and talents that are reposed among us. Now those are others who have a bit of money, let's share it around. And uh, talking about money, I want to say that uh, the Church of God continues, and therefore if you used to support certain charitable organizations or churches, country or any other, uh, please, please uh, don't, don't slacken because the Church of God continues and all the programs uh, will continue. I mean, some better day is coming. It's around the corner and therefore life continues. Life continues. I want to say the, the fourth thing, uh, or no, the, the fifth thing, that Robert Snash talks about is uh, taking risk, taking risk on the sign of God. See, God does not show us all the way. God does not show you the own journey. He shows you a step at a time. You, those important steps of faith, those baby steps are important. 
And uh, as you take the baby steps, then the steps become a journey. Steps become a journey. And uh, uh, this is what God is inviting us to. A man called Abraham, for example, uh, he saw some visitors, he saw some people traversing the descent in the scorch, scorching heat of the day. And because Abraham was a generous man and he was hospitable, he said, you guys, stop, uh, come to my tent, cool your feet, let me give you something to eat and to drink. And But Abraham got more than he bargained for. Uh, he got a promise that that time, the following year, Sarah would be holding a baby in, his, in her hands. Uh, and, and also, the second message was that uh, because these were angels, they were going to destroy Gomorrah. They said, well, shall we hide this thing from uh, Abraham? So they told him what was going to happen. And Abraham was able to save his cousin Lord. Taking risk. Uh, I'll tell you something about my life. When I was thinking about joining the ministry and I was in prayer, and sometimes well, I was discouraged, thinking, well, what is this that I'm getting myself into? Uh, I shared that with my boss, and I thought my boss, where I was working, uh, for a Christian magazine, an American Christian magazine, Youth for Christ. I thought he would discourage me because he wouldn't want to uh, to lose his worker. But uh, instead of discouraging me, he said he used to call me Geshara, not Jonathan, Geshara. And so Biden told me, Geshara, it is only those who have the courage to lose sight of the shore who can discover the ocean. It is only those who have the courage to lose sight of the shore who can discover the ocean. By God's grace, I have discovered many oceans over the time. And I want to invite you also to discover the ocean. Not the way I discovered mine, but God is leading you in your own way. Today is vocational Sunday, when each and every one of us is inviting to ask, why is God leading me to? Why, what is God saying about my life? I think what we have seen in this, uh, these meditations, one is that God is a, Jesus is a good shepherd. And we also are invited to be good shepherds alongside Jesus, the sheep shepherd of the sheep. I'm also invited to be a shepherd just like he is a shepherd. You also, you are invited to be a shepherd of all God's graces, talents, and uh, other endowments that God has given you. But number two is that uh, we are invited uh, alongside God to create a kind of world, a more hospitable world, as we go out of the way to do that which God is inviting us to. And at the end of time, will you and me, we want to hear from God, thou and good, thou and good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Thank you, God bless. Now, I want us to pray, and uh, before then, uh, we listen to the last track. And uh, the last track is not a very well-known song, but it, it, it causes you uh, to use our talents, you know, and uh, to be there on the side of God. Don't you learn our God. We thank you for this morning. We pray that you help us to walk alongside the Good Shepherd. We want to uphold the issues of our lives before you this time. This is a difficult time. We are going through the thick of a deadly virus. But oh God, you have said that you are the Lord, our healer, 
and nothing is too hard for you. And therefore we can afford to look up to you for grace, for deliverance, and we are a people of hope. Thank you for hearing this our prayers in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and evermore. Amen. Let's listen to the last track. can help somebody as I travel along, then my living shall not be in vain. Amen. <laughs>